Um, so let's just uh, go ahead and, and get started. Um, this is, again, this is the session for um, Natives for the Suburban Yard with Laura Beattie. Uh, my name is Ashley Studholm and I'm with the Prince William Conservation Alliance and it's really wonderful to be here today with everyone. Um, we have about an we have an hour together, and so as we experienced from the previous breakout session, uh, we'll get you know Rob will give us kind of a countdown, and then um, and then everyone will come back to this room since we are in the main room. Uh, so to kind of manage our time together, um, I'm going to keep everyone muted, but please feel free to use the the chat feature. Um, to ask questions or leave your comments um, while Laura will dazzle us with um, all of her wonderful uh, photos and her presentation. Um, so without further ado, um, let's jump into it, shall we? Laura Beatty has been working in the great outdoors since she was old enough to hold a rake. She earned a degree in history, followed by a degree in horticulture, and worked nearly 20 years for the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources and the National Parks Conservation Association. Laura is the VMPS Horticulture Chair and serves as the Potomac Chapter's Propagation Chair at the Native Plant Beds at Green Springs Gardens Park. She is a popular speaker about native plants to master gardener candidates at Green Spring Park, local garden clubs, and, occasion and occasionally propagation workshops at the chapter's beds. Laura is converting her own property to a modified meadow, which includes some trees and shrubs, all native plants. She hopes that her plant inst installations will soon became, become easy maintenance, but as all gardeners know, a garden is a lifelong labor of love. Laura, we're so grateful to have you here today, and I will turn it on over to you. Remember to unmute. Oh wait, I will ask you to unmute in case. Yeah, okay. And I will hit my screen share, right? Exactly. She's keeping me uh, technically uh, involved here, so I get my messages from her and I do what she says. Thank you, Ashley. You're welcome, Laura. Okay, let's see. Okay, it says share. Hit that, share. Am I sharing yet? You are. Uh, let's see once you um, um, present and uh, once you're in present mode, there we go. Now we can see the full thing. Um, now you see it, right? Yep. All right. Well, uh, thanks to Nancy Berlin and Alonzo because they've set everything up for me. We'll be repeating, I'll be repeating many of the things they said. And again, mine's a modified meadow. So uh, yeah, sky's the limit uh, on what I allow in there. So let me um, start with this. And just uh, at the beginning, let me just go through a few little things that you need to keep in mind. This isn't general gardening, this is native plant gardening. So we'll get the right plant in the right place and inviting wildlife into your yard. But understand that uh, inviting wildlife to your yard comes with great responsibility. And that includes uh, leave the leaves on site. And I don't mean in bags out for pickup keep them on site. It restores the soil, protects loss of eggs uh, laid by a lot of caterpillars that are actually in the leaves and trees and drop to the ground, and habitat for overwintering bumblebees, and by the way, fireflies too, which may stay in the ground in the leaves for over two years. So if you, if you dispose of all that, you are disposing of your wildlife. So if you want to have a habitat, keep the leaves on deck. Uh, and also no fall cleanup. And as Nancy had talked about before, leave them there because pollinators will use them. Um, um, it, it's it's uh, it's it's urgent to really understand that you're you're just you're just the manager. You don't get too much involved in this. They know what they're doing. You know this whole habitat thing came along long before we were invented. So we really need to step back, uh, appreciate it, and do what we can to just enhance it somewhat. Uh, keep fallen limbs on site. Build bird shelters because they need them during uh, bad weather and when hawks are after them. 
So this is a great resting place for birds and you'll see a lot of activity in them. Uh, dead tree standing. So few people leave their tree standing when they have a problem with the tree and it needs to come down. It does not need to come down unless it's weak at the base. Keep it standing because they get the side limbs off. We are short of cavity nesting areas for our uh, cavity nesting birds. Uh, well, there's so many of them, small ones, but also the, the woodpeckers. Uh, and absolutely no poisons on site. Absolutely no poisons. Uh, set you need to set the plants free to move around as they want to. You cannot control them. Uh, and then as mentioned also, save the flower stems for next season's pollinators and always have fresh water. Uh, in the winter, I, I have a heater that I keep it going. Just to keep it bad, just to remind you about the dead wood, one fifth of all animals and plant species, and that's about 6,000, depend on dead wood for their existence. So don't go discarding your dead wood, keep it on deck. Um, so now that my disclaimer is done, does anybody still want to stay with me? All right, let's go. Um, I have a half acre property that I got in 2013. Uh, this is a, let me back up just a second. This is a, a dead end street with, oh, maybe uh, 20 houses on it. It was a cornfield back in the 60s and it was divided into plots by individual owners. This is not a subdivision, uh, ranging from, uh, uh, let's say half an acre to three quarters to an acre and everybody on the street uh, has a lot of lawn uh, and a lot of lawn mowers so it, it's a busy street that way and everybody is uh, respectful of everybody else's property and I've never had any problem with what I've been doing in my property and, and especially uh, since they have a lot of lawns they actually like what I'm doing so this is, I've, I've been lucky so far. I have six large um, tulip trees in my yard, three uh, mature black cherries, pines, uh, a large holly and a silver maple. And at the end of the property, as you can see past the mailbox, uh, the big green evergreen back there is the Juniperus virginiana, or they call it red cedar. And that's been there a long time. And that brings in the cedar wax wings, oddly enough, during the, during the winter. So that's really a nice thing to have. Okay, I'm going to go through some, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, see the front of the property, this is uh, in, in 2014, I have a lot of Chinese hollies that really obscure the front of the house, and they, they are gone, but uh, what I do have, now that those are gone, you can now see the lawn, and the lawn has a lot of uh, a native ground cover, uh, evergreen, and this is the, uh, the, common blue violet. The common blue violet ends up being uh, one that supports, um, uh, let's see, supports the great fritillary. And it is really the only one that the fr great fritillary lays their eggs on. And they don't actually lay it on them. They lay it beside them in the brush, the leaf litter, again, leaf litter, leave them there so that they are protected. They then come out uh, when they hatch and crawl toward the leaf and then they are better protected that way. They leave that plant and go back under the litter when they're through eating. So that makes it fun. So this is always going to be a ground cover. Regardless of what I do to the property, it will always be a ground cover there. The plants in the front were uh, the sort of exotic plants that were uh, planted by the, the earliest neighbor, the earliest owner. And a lot of those have, well, they've kind of disappeared now. This is a side yard. Uh, this is a property that has an acre on the side of me, and uh, sadly, three large tulip trees were cut down in an effort to try to build a large house there, and the permit was denied, and the trees were nevertheless gone. On the other hand, I do get a lot of sun. This is with the southwest view, so I get a lot of sun, so the, uh, the uh, ditch that I'm surrounded by in the front yard and the side yard gets a lot of sun, so that's very, very beneficial to me. Uh, I, 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 do, I did mow my lawn for a long time and uh, it, I did decide to leave it so that I could <clears throat> make sort of a blueprint of the lawn to find out where I, <clears throat> where I want to, excuse me, <clears throat> break it up and decide where I would put the, the woodies and the perennials. So this is what became the sidewalk. And again, this is also a, a, a visual for people who think, Oh, well, that, that can't be just a messy yard. Look at that walkway. 
Well, this is a six foot walkway and that was designed to include the fact that plants on both sides would fall into it and you'd still have a way to get to the front door. And this is worked out very well. And this is, uh, uh, it's only taken a few years. This walkway went in in 2017 at the end of the year. And this is, um, has done well. All right, from the roof, the aerial of how I decided to lay out the yard with the mower, the areas that are, are mowed are the um, walking areas. I don't know if my cursor will do this. Can you see the cursor here? Can you see my cursor? Anyway, yes, this is, it's this small, is but we can see it. This is now the rock garden. This is a large ornamental rock, big showy rock. It's disappeared with all the plants around it though. Uh, here is where I have the woody. So I'll show you the uh, viburnum prunifolium and the aronia uh, melanocarpa. I've got a lot of them along here. Here I've got now, besides a persimmon that is put itself in there, so I've got a nice persimmon there, uh, some uh, a, a red bud, and then all kinds of uh, plants along there. And again, I don't, uh, I can, I can put some plants in, but I let them decide where they want to be. Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, about 2017, uh, 2018, and this is, I've actually put two pictures together to make it easier to see the corner of the property from the street, and then off to the right is where the ditch is. And then uh, of course off the left is the driveway. But you can see in the wet area that you don't see it because there's so much there, but there's Itea in there. There's Menarda fistulosa, Menarda didyma, uh, uh, lots of, um, uh, of sumac in there, uh, the God of goldenrod. And th these things, th they move themselves in there. I just, I just monitor. If, if someone's getting crowded out and it looks like they want to survive, I'll, I'll help them out. Otherwise, it really does take care of itself. Uh, now this is from a previous property uh, it, it, that had a wooded, a wooded slope. And I just want to start showing you some of the plants that would go into uh, a, a suburban lawn yard if you have uh, sort of the same kind of conditions. And this, would, this is a, a wooded hillside, but it has leaves that have been dropping uh, for hundreds of years and it's rich soil and the spice bush. The Lindira benzoin is one of the big uh, early, early uh, bloomers in our area. It's um, uh, a beautiful flower, comes out early. Here's March 17. This is the, the male plant. You need separate male, female plant in order to move along and get the berries started. And this is in May 17. Um, the ripe berries, about August, uh, these are uh, these are a very valuable food source for migrating birds. It's a rich, rich berry, lots of lipids, lots of oils. It sustains them in flight. Uh, sadly, uh, if, if these are in wooded areas, we know with the invasive plants, they are getting eaten up and being replaced by uh, the bush honeysuckle. Red berry, blooming the same time of the year, uh, so if a bird can't find this, it goes to the uh, bush honeysuckle, and of course then we'll spread them everywhere. But, but the problem there is that uh, it is not, a, it's junk food, and it does not sustain birds on flight. It's a, it's a, it's a cheap berry, it's a cheap snack, but it's, it's not durable. So this is why whenever you can, when you have the opportunity or the, or the location in the yard to do it, start getting the Lendir benzoin uh, put in. Oh, would that, uh, Alonzo mentioned this and he had a whole jar full of berries from the June berry, the Amelanchia. I, I, uh, I don't have any on mine yet, but I do remember way back before Tyson's was built uh, that all along the road on Chambridge Road 123 were lots of this blooming early spring. You go, what is that white flower blooming so early by the side of the road? It was the June berry. There's of course not so many now, but where you have it, it's wonderful. This one is in my yard and it's about seven years old, and it's, it's picking up its speed now, and you notice that it's, well, it's in a cage. I have a lot of caged things in my yard. Until they get tall enough to protect themselves against the deer, I leave the cage on, uh, and that's uh, it's just way of life right now. They're working on that, but um, you know, you, you never know when that's gonna happen, when they can reduce the population size of the deer. Pecker aria, everybody uses it and they do it for a good reason. Not only is it a beautiful <clears throat> evergreen ground cover, 
a year round, evergreen. Uh, it also has very fibrous roots and that helps them hold hillsides down. So it's very beneficial. And then on top of all that, there it is, early spring. And if the, as the emerging uh, ground nesting bees start to come up <clears throat> and the other pollinators, it is available, it is ready. I can show you 50 pictures with different insects on every one of them. So it's a big, big hitter in the spring. Uh, very useful plant and, and works well in a community. Now in a community, I mean, I didn't plant that. They planted themselves. I installed them around different areas and uh, they moved out from there. Uh, what you see is blue uh, down the hill there is the, uh, the Phlox paniculata. I'm sorry, it's the Phlox stolonifera. That, that changed that name. That's, that's not paniculata, that is Phlox stolonifera. And that moves down on the ground, moves in between. They, they get along, they just find space and they work it. So these little natural communities will form themselves if you try not to monitor them or just make, make decisions for them that they really like to make for themselves. Uh, this is the, um, a, a very pretty little ground cover, uh, Viola striata. It's fragrant, it pours like a violet seeds. And, and this is in a, a porous sort of walkway. They're just on sand, stones and brick on sand. And it would pop up between them and it's just glorious looking. It also does really well. It's been in a pot for about seven years, just looks great. So this is a good potted plant too. Now the violet, there you go. Look at that, it escaped right down the hill and is joining the rest of these plants. And here we've got some of the Virginia bluebells that are, are coming up. Let's see what else I've got. The golden ragwort, of course, is there. The heart-leafed aster are there. The, the uh, white wood asters, they're all just in leaf form at this point, but they're ready for their time later on in the season. This is a, what you call a wild garden that has really wilded out itself. It's sitting underneath uh, a hickory, a white oak. So it has, it's a, it's a it, right now in the springtime, it's still pretty bright there, but eventually it will be uh, covered with a lot of good shade. Another really nice plant uh, for spring is the golden Alexander. Uh, it's uh, a lot of plants, a lot of plants going, growing together. Uh, it's, um, it's a sort of a wildflower community. So you, you've got the, the Jacob's Ladder, the ferns are coming in, the, the sensitive fern is about to show up, partly aster, um, the white wood asters starting to come up. And this is also near a bottomnut tree, which I'll, I'll try to cover that one later. But again, they, they arrange themselves and they, this is, you know, you just let them do what they're going to do. Uh, by the way, this hillside that we're working at, I, I spent about three years removing microcesium from it, the stilt grass. And I started from the top and I did all I could one season, knowing that I've gotten everything from the top, so it won't be adding to the bottom. Uh, and uh, and that over what time it, it, it disappeared. So I, I was lucky that it, it, it threw in the cow and gave up. This is the nice form of this Zizia um, Alexander. Forget the aria down there. I need, I really do need an editor when I do this stuff. But this is Zizia, uh, I mean Golden Alexander, it is correct, Zizia aria, but it's Golden Alexander and it is the host plant for the black tailed swallowtail. I mean the black swallowtail. It really, we are selling it in pots one year and we, we had to pull back our pots because the caterpillars had gone through it and eaten up all the vegetation. But the next year it was fine. So they were, everybody was happy. And Nancy mentioned the uh, Salvia Lareda. And this is uh, a beautiful evergreen ground cover. Hers were a little darker. Uh, this one that we have at our beds uh, has the blue veins, the darker veins through it. But the top part of it is uh, it can get up 18 inches, even maybe two feet, but mostly 18. Uh, a beautiful flower. It's very delicate. It's a great ground cover because it fills in where other things don't. And also, once it gets the seed set, you'll find birds getting on the stem and working the seeds out of it. So it's, it's sort of all purpose. And this has been mentioned a few times. This is the uh, coral honeysuckle. And again, it will bloom. We have some in our beds that will bloom or are blooming and are still setting berries into December if the weather's right. Their goal though, their purpose is to be ready by April 15th 
along with the uh, columbine and the, and the pink's azalea, these are the ones that feed the hummingbirds when they get into our area, and generally that's about April 15th. And yet it's a, a fabulous, fabulous uh, vine to have, and it looks great on support. So this is one that if you don't have it and you have a place for it, try to add it to there. I've mentioned the Jacob's Ladder that you saw in the meadow there. This is a, an all-purpose plant for pollinators. It, it handles all the various types of pollinators. Uh, and hey, Laura. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you get a little bit closer to your mic? Um, okay. Some folks are okay. struggling to hear your wonderful words uh, that go along with that, your photos. That, tell me, is that better? Is that better? Uh, you know, we straightened this out yesterday, but I, I, I thought it was straightened out. There was certain yeah. buttons I pushed, but I can't walk through that. I don't know. So, Folks, can you um, let me know in the chat if, um, if that's that's better? I hear you just okay. fine, but okay. thank you. All right, sorry to interrupt, no, but no, I didn't no. want people to miss it. Letting me know, I appreciate it. Um, a, a little sun on this will keep it from flopping, and it doesn't take. Uh, it can also take shade, but a little sun helps it out. But it's a, gl a glorious, glorious plant, and uh, the bumblebees will attribute to that. I tried to get her photo; she wouldn't come out. So I'm sorry I couldn't introduce her, but the, the, blue, the bumblebees just really do love this plant. Over. Uh, Jacob's, okay, here's another little community with the Jacob's Ladder. And this one has got a, a trillium back there, uh, lots of ferns, whitewood asters, uh, heart-leafed asters. Uh, it, uh, again, this is slowly sort of growing together. Uh, all the uh, leaves are still down there. Any, any, any uh, branches that fall stay in place and degrade or decompose and provide for all of this beautiful um, habitat. And this is sitting around a beautiful white oak tree. Okay, an early, an early bloomer, again, uh, for pollinators. Uh, I'd like to show you a lot more pictures of this with pollinators all over it, but you know, the clock's ticking, so I couldn't do that many. But this is about April 12th or so, and it's an early supporter. It does colonize, so you may end up with a multi-branched thing that keeps moving around. You could always clip them off or just, again, stand back and let them do what they're going to do, see what happens. Black haw, the prunifolium, this is one I put in the front. It's a, a, it has a very nice structure to it. I remember someone once saying that if we ever lose our dogwoods, this would be a great plant to replace it with. It's got good, good structure on it, beautiful leaves, and uh, great flowers and berries. So uh, the black haw, the viburnum prunifolium, is really a wonderful plant. And it, I, I had to, again, limit my photos, so I can't show you the fall color, but it is, it is quite beautiful. Now, let's see if I got this right. Okay, this is not a black haw. This is the, um, um, let's see, what number am I? This is, a, a, of course, Viburnum dentatum, and that's the flower of the dentatum. Um, and it's, um, uh, it can be a tall one. So in the next picture on the left side shows a, a second story balcony, and it is already above that. So it's up to 12 feet, and it really has only been there uh, since about 2013. So it's, it's a good performer. And it's also a great plant. Birds love to sit in it. So it's a... a I really like like those. I love those viburnas, but this one is a really nice one too. Okay, sassafras. Now there's a little problem with some of our sassafrases. It's all along the east coast, but there is a a, a wilt that's moving in, and uh, I'm hoping that that because there's so many in the whole east coast, that some remedy will be found for it. But it is a gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. Uh, it's called, uh, let's see, uh, it's a vascular wilt. It's the Red Bay Ambrosia beetle that's doing this. And I hope they get that uh, under control. Really, really beautiful flowers. Yeah, and my very favorite thing about this, this tree is its fall color. It is actually spectacular. This one is at our growing beds uh, on the, the house behind us, but it does sucker also. So we get some into our area also. The Actea. I'm missing something. One of my one of my flowers is missing. I'm not going to try and fix it, or the whole thing will blow up. So I'm not going to do it. Uh, this is the black coash, or actia, racemosa, uh, and it uh, 
it really loves to have, um, uh, I mean, it does, it's pollinated by not only bumblebees, but small bees and beetles also. Here should be a better, oh, why am I not getting the picture? Are you all getting the picture? No, we're not, we see a blank screen. Well, that's not good. How about on your, can you, uh, let me go for it. Um, let's see, let me see where you are. It's a, it's oh. a, that number um, uh, 37. Yep, I have it on mine. Would you like me to start sharing my screen instead? Me too, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing yours. And we'll share mine. All right, Laura, um, let me go in presenter mode. Is that where you'd like to be? Yes, that's it. Now, okay, I'll, you just tell me when to move. Yes, I'll tell you when. Okay, it's uh, this is the uh, the black coash, it's had a lot of names. It used to be called mm -hmm. semi-suffuga, if you remember that one. And it's also called fairy candle because it is so beautiful. Here it is, again, in a natural habitat, spreading as it will next to a rhododendron. Uh, above it is uh, Virginia magnolia and a silky dogwood. A uh, lot of ferns that like this area. It's shady, lots of humus in the soil, lots of leaf de de uh, debris on the ground that helps, that helps nurture the whole area. Uh, okay, go to the next one. Okay, this is what is growing above it, and it's, it's probably up to about 12 or 14 feet, a silky dogwood. Uh, it, the interesting thing about the silky dogwood is that the berries are a kind of a silvery blue color, so they're very beautiful. Again, pollinators all over it. It is definitely a useful plant for a wildlife habitat. Okay. Okay, one of my favorite perennials, and this is an, an August flower, is the bone set, the Eupatorium foliatum. And uh, I love it because, just look at it, look at the architecture on that. It's just so stunning. And it, again, has lots of friends and neighbors that it lives with that, uh, it, that work well with it and, and enhance it. Let me get the next slide. Okay, here it is with the uh, uh, Lobelia syphilitica and the golden rod down below. So all these colors mesh together uh, and the bone set and the, and the blue lobia, they just look fabulous together. And the yellow just adds that right touch to it. Okay. Another thing that adds a touch to the garden is the Persicaria virginiana or the Virginia jump seed. A lot of people think it, no, it's kind of a weed, but it's not. This is a very useful plant for small, very small pollinators, as you'll see there, uh, but also for um, uh, birds. So next one. Here it is, here it is, uh, no, one more. Okay, here it is again uh, with the Rebecca, and, and shortly the, the large leaf, dark leaf plant off to the left is the uh, phlox uh, uh, that will be blooming bright pink flowers. So this whole thing comes together and the, the persicaria, the, the array of flowers there, gives it a sense of a, a floral arrangement, like a baby's breath. So it, it uh, go ahead, it, uh, it really does look nice. And the cardinals especially will jump on those stems of the jump seed and eat the seeds out. So it's also good for, for wildlife and probably many other things. Okay, next one. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the Aurelia racemosa, uh, American spikenard. This is a, a very tall, herbaceous perennial. And by that, it means all of that drops dead in the winter. So all that growth is gone, but it's stunning with the black, the black stems on it. Uh, this is in flower at this point. Uh, the berries will be coming. Berries. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's more, more of the flower. This also shows how uh, striking the black stem is with the flowers themselves. It's a big leaf, big bold, but still a delicate looking flower um, a plant uh, that again dies back to the ground. It is the same family as the Aurelia spinosa, that very large one. And uh, I've got that in my current yard and you don't want to grow that without adult supervision. Spinosa is a, a powerful plant that 
sends up thorny uh, stems everywhere. Okay, next one. Here's the, here's the berries on this. And they're very small and they don't last long because the birds love them. But I did, uh, I did watch, observe, and took photos, but you can't put them all on, of uh, the a yellow jacket and a bumblebee sucking on the berries. Now they suck the liquid out of it and what they leave is just sort of a desiccated little berry hanging there with the skin and the seeds inside which ultimately dry up and fall to the ground. So uh, it's really, next one, it's really a fine plant to have. Just wanted to show you how vigorous uh, the plants can be if you just let them do what they're going to do. Of course you always need water in a habitat. This is April 2016 in the same area, next one. Okay, this is in 2017. Many plants are emerging, in, including mint, uh, Monarda fistulosa. This is fleabane. I love the fleabane in the yard. It was there naturally. I just keep it. And the golden alexander and, and, and many more. It just keeps in, in, enlarging. Later in the season, the Helen's flower will be on the other side of it. So it, it just uh, it, it, it's, it keeps working through the season. And of course, I see every now and then you've got to go in and pull the tulip trees out because I've got always get a lot of tulip trees around my yard. Next one. Okay, this is a this is one I just uh, put in about maybe four years ago, uh, and it's um, it's an amphora fruticosa. Let's see if I spelled it. Nope, spelled it wrong. If you're going to write fruticosa, you put the I after the T. So keep that in mind. Um, and this was, uh, this is May 3rd, 30th. So you get to see the flowers blooming. And it is, it, it does sucker a little bit. It supposedly doesn't like a wet area, but they're always found nature along the stream banks and things. So, so uh, they're pretty easy about what they want. But this one, again, is on that side of the yard where the sun now shines in the afternoon. So let me get the next picture and I'll show you why people uh, think it's so cool. It's the orange and yellow anthers that set off sort of the purple background that makes it look uh, really, really interesting. And again, pollinators all over, it, especially the bumblebees. And this again forms thickets. Okay, next one. You can't have a yard without an elderberry. This is uh, uh, in a neighbor's yard that uh, it has a really, really nice form as elderberries do. Lots of pretty flowers. I do want to draw your attention to the area between the two trees. She has inadvertently done the right thing and she stacks up all of her sticks in one place and there are birds going in and out of there. I have three of those piles in my yard and I don't have any loose sticks around. Sometimes I borrow sticks from neighbors to keep adding to mine because gosh darn it, they decompose and I have to keep adding sticks. So keep that around. It's good to have, good to keep that wood on deck and it's also nice for birds for sanctuary and Mice are under there too, so it's a place for them to go. Elderberry uh, is, um, yeah, the next picture is great. Has incredible amount of berries on it, and you think, and they are very good. They're very tasty. Uh, uh, if you think you're going to go ahead and I'll oh, wait tomorrow and, and, and try some tomorrow, they're gone. So if you see them, grab some because they move quickly. All right. Okay, the next one. Okay, this is a, a caged, my caged goat beard, the goat's beard, and this, uh, this is again, keeps it dear. There would be no flowers if I didn't cage it. Uh, Aruncus diochius, dioecus, and it's uh, also called much better than goat's beard. It also has a name of bride's feathers. Get the next picture. Yes, and you can see it is a glorious, beautiful plant in a slightly shaded wet area. Doesn't have to be wet, just not dried out. This is a, a really handsome plant. We'll fill in again around areas. Next picture. I wanted to show you the flowers up close. It does, uh, it does take in the, uh, uh, invite the small carpenter bee, but also beetles and all kinds of little things. Even a larva of the uh, lady beetle is on here on another picture. Okay, next picture. Okay, I'm sure you all have seen this or heard of it, or I hope a lot of you have it. Uh, the button bush is really a, a wonderful plant. Uh, it's uh, blooming a little later in the season. I've got mine in a part of the yard that is not wet, but it is a ditch, an indented area that holds moisture, so it, it's doing fine. Next picture. This, uh, this is up close on it, and it really is an attractive flower and fun to watch, and pollinators, again, 
uh, love this. Butterflies, bees. Sometimes you can't even see the picture of the flower because everything's in the way. They're all there. Okay, another picture. This is uh, from Huntley Meadows, and this button bush there actually grows under the water, grows there, right in the water. So think about a rain garden. This would be a perfect plant. Sun and, and rain and, and a rain garden is perfect for them. You might even get a turtle if you do it, right? Okay, next one. Now, some things don't want wet. They want dry. And um, this is a, a rock wall where a lot of things are growing and above it that don't want to be wet. However, the best thing about rocks, and ask Alan Ford any time about rock gardens because he's an expert. We've got them in our beds and it, they, they can't, we, we need a shoehorn to get any more in than we've got in there. They love it there. Uh, next picture. This shows, uh, this shows the uh, uh, very pretty, very native uh, evergreen partridge berry, Nichella repens. And it has uh, twin uh, trumpet flowers that come up in June. Later in the season, it has red berries, and those are good for the partridge in your area. Now, if you should not have partridge, any bird will like it, and a lot of mammals like it too, so it will not go to waste. And it's actually a very attractive plant, and it just finds its way underneath everything else. Okay, next one. One of our speakers had mentioned uh, that there's uh, some decorative naughty onion, uh, onion plants, and this is one of them. And they are, this is not quite unfurled yet. When they do, they are uh, wide open. I just dump it in there. It's probably at least half an hour. What was that? Did I hear someone? Okay. Uh, next picture. Next picture. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I'm sorry. It, it froze on me. Um, oh, yeah. oh, yes. <laughs> hold on a second. Let me just reshare. Let me try mine again and see if I can. Uh, I can. I'm, I'm going to reshare it. Here we go. Nope. Okay, let me, let me try mine again. Okay, I'll stop sharing and you can try to do it. Oops, there, mine went blank again. Okay, never mind. Um, well, hold on. Let me do this one more time. Yeah, here, I'll share this. For, the, for those out there, the, the reason there's a problem is that I've got a, I've got an Apple program that I tried to switch over to a PowerPoint. And that's good for normal people, but I, I'm not techie. I can't figure this stuff out. Okay, so we have the nodding onion okay. here. Okay, then. And let's see if we can do it. Okay, now it's starting to unfurl now. Uh, it, it, it does attract a lot of pollinators, especially bumblebees that just hang underneath it. It's, a, it's more diminutive than a lot of the garden plants you've got or the native plants. But it, 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 if, you're, if you're wanting to sort of set back this, you know, the high canopy, the understory, the shrubs, and, and uh, other perennials, this is a smaller one, so you'd set it on the edge of those. Next, next picture. Okay, this is sort of what its form looks like, and uh, it's, uh, it is a very attractive plant, and there always are a lot of pollinators in it. Okay, this is one of the, um, one of the first shrubs I put in, the Aronia Mel melanocarpa, which is a black chokeberry, uh, and uh, the next slide will show if you do grow it, uh, you grow up between driveways, it ends up being a nice privacy fence. Uh, very tall, very useful, beautiful flowers, uh, what they, which we just saw. Let me see the next picture. This is up to about 12 feet now. You can see all the black clusters of flowers. The melanocarpa has the black clusters. And uh, the next one. This is up close on, on the berries. And they're, uh, they're very attractive. I, you know, the, the uh, catbirds come in, the crows come in, and also the next picture. Yes, the mammals, the chipmunks come in and, and stuff their face full of them. Uh, and it's a, uh, it's a real wildlife tree. Besides being just beautiful to look at, it is definitely a wildlife tree. Okay, the next one. This is a uh, culver's root, Veronicastrum virginicum, which is uh, a, a very handsome plant in the right place. 
which is uh, sunlight with a little bit of moisture, does not want to be dry. Uh, it can go up to about five feet. Stunning, stunning uh, plant that mixes well uh, with the next picture, with a lot of the garden plants, the native plants, and this is the, the Heliopsis helianthoides, which they look very, very good together. Okay, the next one. This is my favorite. This is when it's just emerging and it's so graceful as it starts to reach up and send out its uh, stem all the way. This is around August 8th on this. Okay, now onward. Okay, we've mentioned Joe Pye a lot today. This one um, is along a driveway and of course the water from the driveway goes into that middle area. So this is where the monocarpa was. The, the, of the Arumia. Uh, this one, uh, if, if people are worried about this sometimes in that it's, it, it, it gets too tall for them. In around July 1st, you can cut these in half and they will be, they will be less, uh, they, if you have a problem with the height, then they can be, they can be shortened at that time of year, but not beyond that. This is in August, this is in my yard, current yard, under one of my tulip trees and you gotta count them. There are seven tiger swallowtails on this plant. And they, they, they don't stay still, but if you count them, they're all there. And, and why shouldn't they be there? This is a plant that has a host plant of the tulip tree and the black cherry. Those are the plants I have, the trees I have in my yard. So of course I'm gonna have a lot of those. But in this, you can see emerging, uh, about to bloom even, the white wood aster on the left side. Um, the uh, in front is jewelweed that will be opening soon toward the left side. Going back uh, is uh, the uh, late fall aster that are starting to come up. The tree that's caged behind it is a Carpinus caroliniana, the musclewood tree, which uh, it, it, again, as it grows together, it's all going to be um, quite a habitat there. And that's just on a walkway, a sideway between a neighbor's property on the other side and the house itself. Okay, next one. So if uh, on that tree, on that thing we just looked at, I forgot to mention, up that uh, tulip tree was growing uh, some uh, Virginia creeper. And I want to remind you that Virginia creeper is a wonderful plant, a great vine. It is a deciduous vine as opposed to these invasives that go in and tear trees down. This works with the tree, gets up high, provides the berries that again, those pollinators, the, uh, not the pollinators, but the, the, um, the migrators need. Very useful, very useful food. So is poison ivy, by the way. That's a great food for migrators. Um, but this one, uh, I, I always wanted to get back to it to see what it looked like when it turns that brilliant burgundy and orange color during the fall, but I missed that. Okay, next picture. It's not working. <laughs> oh, sorry. Keeps doing that every time I mute myself when I hear people in my house being loud. <laughs> I don't want to disrupt it. Okay, here we go. One more time. Okay, we're down to, um, let's see, uh, 75. Yes. Okay, now the only way you're going to get a cast member from Beetlejuice to show up in your yard is to plant a mint. This one is the Hoary Mountain Mint and that's a Tachinid fly. I love those flies. They are so cool. Uh, there's a number of them, uh, but on this mint, as has been said by the past speakers, pollinators love this. You give a hundred slides and you can have a hundred different insects on it. Wasps, bees, all sorts of things. This is, uh, and butterflies. This is a great plant to have uh, and they do move around. So you know, put it in competition with something that's just as strong as it is. Okay, next one. Okay, the Coniclinium cholestinum, this flower. This was mentioned, I think Nancy, um, Nancy, I think Nancy mentioned this one. This is a, 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 a very beautiful plant. It is the favorite for my studies, my research, my observation. This is a plant that the, the monarch butterflies like the most. Um, it, uh, it, it does reseed a lot, but uh, that's, that's fine. It's working its way through my garden. Let me get the next picture. This is my proof. When, I, when we go to the beds and we have the, the, the mist flower everywhere, 
this and it's a ray of flowers they can be jumping on. This is what they go to. So if you want a reliable source to get monarchs, do the blue mist. I've, I've proven that it does attract them. Okay, next one. Okay, here's the, the Virginia jump seed again, getting involved with the uh, jewelweed. And you can see at the very bottom, a little jewelweed starting to bloom, the orange color. This was one that is pollinated by, well, the bees like it too, but hummingbirds. Hummingbirds love this plant. And you can see sort of the effect of the persicaria, the jump seed flowers, how pretty they look. Uh, is a combination. These plants uh, would like a, a, a moist area. Jewelweed will always show up if you've got a moist section of your yard. So add that to your moist section. All right, next one. There it is. There's the, there's the jewelweed with the jeweled uh, sweat bee in there, the green one. It's beautiful. So this is what uh, the pollinators uh, use, but also the hummingbirds do and they get to the very back of that plant in order to get the nectar. As you can see on the left corner, it curls around the end of the nectar is underneath the plant, curls around into the there. And that's where that's what they're going for. Okay. All right, a lot of, lot of talk about uh, using straight species because uh, what these flowers are sending up is a message. They, uh, like pollinators, they all have a goal. They have a season ending coming up. They've got to complete their generation, complete their task, and set seed. And the pollinators, of course, need to lay their eggs. This time of year in the fall is getting close to winter. So uh, the idea of these flashy plants coming out and blooming is a great for pollinators. They need masses in order to see it and to come in and stay all day and enjoy it. So it's, uh, it's always good to keep these going, and they will reseed. Uh, goldenrod we see they're, they're in every portion of my yard and again I've got about three or four different varieties so I've got shady ones also the blue stem goldenrod and the zigzag goldenrod that doesn't need so much uh, sun. Okay also during this time of year uh, for color is the beautyberry and this is the Americana. The uh, in my yard previously was the uh, Calicarpa japonica and they tend to be very weedy and they keep coming up. I think I've gotten the last of them that come up. But this is a much larger berry, larger leaves, bigger, bolder plant than the japonica. So this is one that uh, you get to enjoy. Let me get my tune. Am I late? Okay. I'm we have about 10 more minutes. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, okay. This is, this is, this is good. This is, uh, there's a, uh, I know you've all said, I've gone through this whole program and I haven't even mentioned a milkweed. Well, you're right, because I figure everybody else was gonna mention milkweeds, but this one is the boldest of them all. And at one time it can have you know, 50 pollinators on it and butterflies. This is a great plant. And if you don't have this plant in your yard, which it, you won't get these wonderful little students coming in and pointing out uh, a emerging monarch. So this, this is a, a treat in itself. Now, that's a great reason, all those reasons to bring the kids in, to show them the butterflies emerging and having all the pollinators satisfied. But there's one more thing, the showstopper uh, that uh, is for, for everyone, is that this is uh, the show time for the uh, pas de deux ballet move by the butterflies. Eastern tiger swallowtails. You don't know how much convincing it took me to get them to set themselves up like that. It was a real effort. But they were rewarded by the nectar and they love it. All right, next picture. One of the last blooms of our season is the um, witch hazel. And it, it does have a very strong fragrance, wonderful fragrance, especially at night. So if you look at your pollinator syndrome tables and you, you check it out, this kind of plant, because of the, the, uh, the fragrance at night and the color of it, this is pollinated by moths that come out at night and follow the scent and follow any reflection from the moonlight. So that's, you know, from all that I figured out, this is a, a moth pollinated plant. Plus, I'm sure there's lots of beetles that roam around too. But this is a, a really wonderful plant and uh, it's slow growing, but worth a while to get it in. Okay, next one. Okay, well, we know we've had this, this is from the recent uh, snowstorm. So uh, what, what, what you want to look at here is that 
Uh, I'm true to my word. Nothing has been removed. Everything that grew there all season is still there, but now it's decorated by snow. Um, so this is what's going to stay all season long, and it's good for a lot of things. First of all, the stems are there for uh, any pollinators that want to use them, and mostly if they don't want to use them, of course, they will be cut at the uh, end of March, and I will put them in large containers and, uh, and fix them into the ground so that they are decorative. And, uh, and uh, next picture. What this also is providing for, there is a finch, a white-throated sparrow, and a junco. They are underneath this whole buildup of uh, stems and snow. They're down at the bottom and they're going through the leaves, getting seeds, but also under those leaves are also overwintering insects. So this is a, a natural shelter for, uh, for the birds. It's, there's no reason for you not to leave it there, but this is another reason is it is also a, a shelter and food supply for, uh, for the birds. Okay, one more. Okay, I, I'm, I've gotten the feeling after I'm watching uh, a lot of hawks come by, overfly, sit and watch, that I've actually become a habitat because they're there and, uh, to, and I've got foxes, and so I've got a lot of things and I've got a ground, groundhog also, a lot of uh, animals, but I do have a lot of um, chipmunks and a lot of mice. So they are being monitored by not only the fox, but also by the hawks. Okay, one more, and that is, um, Thank you all for your time. Thank you for considering doing your yard as a native habitat. I swear you will get more out of it than those insects do and that the birds do because it's so enjoyable to watch them. And I'd be happy to answer or attempt to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much, Laura. And there's so many wonderful um, suggestions that you provided just from leaving the flower stems to um, leaving the standing dead wood for woodpeckers and so many more um, insects and, and such. We're, uh, we have a couple of minutes. We're going to come back um, at 1210. So we'll take advantage of, um, of this time to answer. There's a lot of really great questions. So I'm going to start from the beginning um, to go through, let's see. Um, so Christina Watts asks, uh, I get, um, is it beneficial to leave some of the leaves but not a very thick carpet of them on your yard. So kind of going back to um, leaving the leaf litter on your yard. Uh, I, I think it depends on your yard, um, the size of your yard and, uh, and, uh, and what you're trying to protect. It will definitely discourage turf if you're worried about uh, keeping a part of your yard as, as, as grass. Yeah, you'd want to pull that. You don't want the leaves to overwinter on the grass because that will discourage the grass. Uh, but you can also take some of it and put it underneath um, uh, shrubs, uh, or even pathways. So there's there's ways you can try to find places for it. And I understand, you know, uh, that it's not always um, beneficial. The tulip tree leaves that I get disappear so quickly; they break down very fast, as opposed to oak tree leaves that that stay around a lot longer. But uh, now, you, you, if you have turf you need and you want to keep it, you need to keep the leaves off of that. But try to uh, find other alternatives to, uh, to storing it, even if you just store it in bags over winter. That way you can release it in, the, uh, in spring or late spring when you actually want some more mulch somewhere. So don't throw away something that you may want to use later. And again, in those leaves, maybe seeds and future uh, caterpillars and all sorts of things, including fireflies. So uh, don't dispose of it unless you absolutely have to. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Laura. And Andrea asks, is there a way to know when you purchase a spice bush if they're male or female? No, there isn't. Unless they're in bloom, you're not going to know. So when we sell them in our beds, we suggest they buy uh, about three of them. And the odds are they might get one of each, at least one of each. It uh, doesn't always work that way, but uh, that's, what we, that's what we recommend, and that's the best way to, to play the odds, so to speak. Yeah. Someone was asking, they're having um, a struggle with a honeysuckle and um, un infiltrating under a bush of uh, their hollies. So how can they counter the invasion? Uh, this is, uh, I, I assume, the invasive honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle? 
I yeah. assume so. That is. Look, what I do at the bottom is like when you're removing ivy from a tree, you just go to the bottom where it's got to start up the bottom somewhere to get up that tree. Cut that. Cut that to stop that. Eventually, you can start pulling it out once it dries out and then removing it from the ground when the ground is soft. Uh, try to do it without disturbing everything around it. But definitely cut it at the base so that it no longer has a lifeline to take uh, energy up to the top of the plant or you know, the top of the vine. Good questioning. You're right. You've got to get that stuff out of there because they will circle around and as they grow, they will just, they will bind around a, a branch and just cut it off. So it's, it's good. Do it. Yeah. And I realize we have a lot of, of questions here. I will be saving the chat and perhaps um, we can get to some of these questions um, um, at an, an, another time. Um, but the, another one that we have here is um, when you're putting um, these natives in your yard, how much tilling are you doing? Uh, do you plan out which species goes where or, or what's that process like? Yes, I, I, I do it ahead of time. Again, you can tell by the map I made out as to where things would go. And uh, going in there, it was based on what their ultimate size would be. And I don't do a lot of dis destruction, a destru destruction of the soil as I work it. I just get an area big enough, work it, put it through my hands, make sure it's nice and loose, add in some compost, put it in and keep it watered. Uh, and in my case, cage it because there's no point in planting unless I cage things. It's an extra effort, but uh, the hair would be useless otherwise. Um, and I, so I, I know ahead of time what their ultimate size would be. This is real important. And also, the very first things you, into, if you're starting and you're going to start working on a garden, is put the woodies in first. Put your trees and your shrubs in. They're the big plants. Around them can go some of the smaller plants and perennials and ferns and grasses and whatever. But the backbone of your garden is going to be the woodies. So your trees and your shrubs go in first, have an idea of what their size is going to be so you don't have to do a lot of pruning at some point because you, uh, you didn't uh, realize they're going to get so big. If you have a good property and you've got good, good lighting and the ground is not totally uh, dry, uh, they will grow. They will be pretty vigorous. If they get what they need and you get it in the right place, you really just need to stand back and let them do what they're going to do because they will usually perform pretty well. Thank you so much, Laura. We have less than a minute and everyone else will be leaving their breakout sessions and joining this main session. Um, so I realized that we had so many other wonderful questions that we didn't get to. So like I said, I am saving the chat right now. Um, and um, and also this will be recorded, but um, it was great to, to see um, just the whole uh, year of, of flowering um, options. So thank you so much, Laura, for sharing oh, all you of your expertise and your I'm photos. I'm thrilled to be able to do this. Thank you.